Uh, good to see you this afternoon for uh, our, it's our last seminar uh, of the term. Um, so very glad that we've uh, got such a distinguished guest with us today. Um, Professor Hans, uh, Hans Lindahl uh, joins us from the University, uh, Tilburg University, uh, where he is the chair uh, of legal philosophy. Uh, just by a bit of background, uh, Professor Lindahl holds uh, both law and philosophy degrees from, I'll get you to help me with the pronunciation, Universidad Javeriana, Javeriana. Javeriana. Uh, and Bogota, Colombia, uh, as well as uh, earning his doctorate at the Higher Institute of Philosophy of the University of Louvain in uh, Belgium. Uh, he's uh, held appointments in both the philosophy department as well as the law school. He's currently at the law school uh, at Tilburg. Uh, his primary areas are in legal and political philosophy, uh, in which he's published numerous articles um, as well as just uh, three years ago, um, his monograph with OUP, uh, Fault Lines of Globalization, Legal Order, and the Politics of Alegality. He's currently working on a sequel, uh, currently under contract with Cambridge University Press, uh, under the working title Legal Authority and the Globalization of Inclusion and Exclusion, uh, of which today's uh, paper is, uh, is one of the chapters uh, which we'll be discussing. Um, his current research falls primarily in uh, globalization and law, uh, but with a, an eye to uh, connecting questions about the nature of law and legal order with uh, uh, principles and concepts such as freedom, justice, and security, uh, and particularly how the idea of boundaries plays in various issues in European integration uh, as well as elsewhere. Uh, and I should say, just to, to set up his work a little bit, uh, a little bit further, um, in a sense, there's there, there's no longer much, uh, I would say, novelty in in claiming that we need to rethink the nature of law or the idea of the idea the notion of legal order beyond the state. In a sense, that kind of uh, Hans has used me heard me use the phrase before. The, the, the kind of honeymoon of thinking about law beyond the state is kind of over, and I think what remains to be done now is to try and figure out exactly which claims about law and legal order uh, from thinking about this state, which of those we can hold on to and which ones we might have to revise. Uh, so in a, in a sense, the real uh, hard, rigorous work remains to be done. Uh, and one of the nice things I think about Professor Lindahl's work is that he's very much at that sort of cutting edge of thinking about the nature of legal order in a way which is uh, uh, rigorous and, and advancing uh, the field of legal theory. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over. Um, to Professor Lindahl, and thanks very much for coming. Yeah. Thanks to all of you for, for coming. Thanks to those of you who actually had a chance to at least skim through the paper. I don't expect that any of you have actually read almost 39 pages of the piece. But uh, thanks for being here. Thanks very much to, to, bo to both of you for having invited me to come here. It's, it's a real pleasure. It's a, it's a place I've heard a lot about, and uh, it's just great to be here. I, I really appreciate that. Um, let me give you a bit of my own background uh, before wading into the fray um, because uh, I'll have to confess that I'm not very much into the Dworkin heart debate. Um, come from a part of the world where some of that of course has been uh, at the core of some of the legal philosophizing that has been taking place in places like Colombia. But it, um, I didn't ever have the sense that I could add very much to that debate. And um, although I was a legal practitioner for some time, um, I went to take a philosophy degree in Leuven in Belgium and uh, very quickly got enchanted with uh, phenomenology. The Husserl archives, the originals of the Husserl archives are, are in Leuven. And I was also very much taken by analytical philosophy, in particular uh, theories of collective action. One of the things that I find hugely irritating in philosophy is this uh, extraordinary trench war between uh, the analytical and the continental philosophers. It's like uh, the trench wars around Ypres in Belgium in the First World War, where for every meter that you advanced, you had 100,000 casualties, where there was a huge amount of work to be done in collaboration between the two ways of thinking, two idiolects perhaps, but at the end of the day, shared questions. And so my approach to philosophy is to try to look for secret alliances between currents of philosophy 
which are not typically related in particular collective action theory and phenomenology as a way of trying to make sense of contemporary issues. And uh, as, as Mike put it, uh, this, uh, this uh, chapter that, that I'm afraid is difficult to read in the sense that it's a, a standalone chapter, but it's not written in a standalone way, uh, is part of a broader project uh, of a book which I'm writing at this point and stressing like mad about whether I'll be able to finish it in time for the deadline. I know that deadlines are elastic but um, I have a certain uh, sense of responsibility to try to finish it on time. So it's very helpful to me to have a bit of, uh, uh, of, uh, of feedback about, about the ideas in this chapter at this point. As you have not had a chance to look at chapter two, let me just give you a sense of, in a couple of introductory words, uh, where this text is, is coming from. Then I'll say something about how I envisage the structure of the book in general. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll focus a bit more on this, on this spe specific chapter, and then I think we can get into the discussion. Uh, and let me begin, um, as, as Mike put it, I'm, I'm fascinated by the problem of boundaries. Um, and let me begin with a story that actually got my own thinking about the relationship between law and boundaries going. And it's a story that is at the, at the beginning of this book, this previous book that I wrote called Fault Lines of Globalization. I think that it captured for me what I think is at stake in at least part of what legal theory should be doing today. It turned out that my partner and I were having dinner at a restaurant in a town close to Tilburg called Breda. It was an Indonesian restaurant. You should know that people from Indone Indonesia was a colony of the Netherlands until after the war. And there are important cultural differences between uh, Indonesians and uh, Dutch. You know, there's, of course, a proverbial bluntness of the Dutch which goes beyond bluntness, it's simply blatant rudeness. I still think that way. Uh, I'm, I'm being filmed, so I have to be careful about what I say. Uh, and the Indonesians are exquisitely polite in their approach to people. Very circum, circ, sort of indirect speech is the way of being of, of people in Indonesia. It was an Indonesian restaurant. They have magnificent food. And so they, we were there in this restaurant, and it was a wonderful atmosphere. Uh, everyone was just, just enjoying themselves immensely. And then suddenly, a clochard came in, a tramp. Now, this was a big, burly guy, really a big Dutch guy. And as you may know, the Dutch are probably the highest, longest people, tallest people in the world together with the Maasai. Now, this was one of these specimens. Um, he was unkempt. Uh, I wasn't close to the guy, or sufficiently close to smell him, but he must have been smelling pretty badly. And he made a beeline for the main waiter and said in a loud voice that he wanted a beer. And it was clear that he would brook no nonsense. And it was clear also that he would not leave without a fight. So you could see, it was of course there also that cultural difference. And so you could see the chief waiter's brain, you know, spinning like mad. How, how do I get out of this situation? And the hush settled over the room. And uh, all of us were just looking what, what would happen, what would be the next, what would be the plan B. And so what he ended up doing was ushering the guy to a table next to ours and saying, okay, you'll get a, a meal. And uh, so then things get, got back going, very nice atmosphere again and stuff, and everyone forgot the, the, the clochard. And then something literally extra hyphen ordinary happened. Extra ordinary. And that is that when the waiter brought him the meal, um, the clochard with a cherubic smile looked at the waiter and invited him to sit down to have the meal with him. And the guy first froze, the waiter, and then he became physically disoriented. He just didn't really know how to deal with the situation. And so after a couple of seconds of some considerable trepidation, he just bowed and thanked him and went back into the kitchen. Now, what I found interesting about this uh, event, with, with the benefit of hindsight, was in a certain sense, here you see what law, and not only law, but social orders in general do. So what you had here was a restaurant, and if you enter through the door of the restaurant, um, you're expected to do certain things. That is to say, you're expect, you expect to be ushered to a table, you will sit down, uh, you will order a meal, you'll pay for it, and you will leave. And so it's, a, it's already a sort of mini order. 
It's a mini order in the sense that what you see is a structuring of space. There will be tables organized in a certain way. There will be places, so there will be the, the, the cashier, there will be the dining room itself, there will be the kitchen. So there, it's already in itself a sort of articulation of places with boundaries, not fuzzy or less fuzzy, but you can tell the distinction between a kitchen and a dining table and a cashier. Certain agencies, roles of subjectivities, so it's considerably different to be a, a waiter, to being a cook, to being a, a, a guest. There's also a temporality, not the temporality of calendar time, but the, se the proper sequence to do things. So you'll come in, you will sit down, you will order, you will eat, you will pay, and you will leave. And so there's a, there's a sequence there to do things, a proper sequence to do things. So I've, I've already re referred to space, I've referred to time, I've re referred to subjectivity, and, I've re and there's also what you do. So there are proper things that you do if you're a waiter, if you're a, if you're a cook, if you're a, a, a guest, and so forth. So what I want to say is that very simply, uh, law, like a broader range of social orders, orders space, time, subjectivities, and act contents. And it does so by setting boundaries. There are, of course, spatial boundaries, like the threshold, the door that separates and joins the restaurant from the, from the, from the street. But there are also temporal boundaries, not in the sense of a, a certain second at which you should be able to do something or not do something, but the proper sequence that takes you from ordering to eating to paying and so forth. Boundaries in terms of who does what, etc. Now what was interesting, so that's what law does. Law organizes space, time, subjectivity and act contents. It's obvious. But one of the points and one of the difficulties, I think, in legal theory today is that we're so obsessed with the notion of a legal system in the sense of uh, a unity of norms. And of course, our whole legal education is organized such that we discuss uh, codes of law, statutes, etc. that for us, law is very much the norms. And of course, we need the norms, but the norms are basically rules for orientation in space, in time, in subjectivity, and act contents. Which means that in itself, law is continuously a, bound, a boundary setting process. Now, what happened with the Clochard? When he came in, what happened there was that at one level, his act was an illegal act, I think it's fair to say. He was playing on the fact that he realized that the um, atmosphere in that restaurant would be destroyed and it would be bad business for the restaurant if he were thrown out or if the police were called in. So in a sense, he was placing the, the, the uh, restaurant under duress. It might be a criminal act. So there was a, le a level of illegality. What he was doing there was breaching boundaries. But he wasn't only breaching boundaries. He was also transgressing them. What I mean to say by that is that if you ask the question, where was the guy coming from when he came in? The obvious answer would be, of course, from the street. But in a certain sense, it's, that's too simple. What the guy was also doing was presenting a configuration of space, of time, of subjectivities, and of act content, which simply didn't fit into the way that legal order distributes these positions, orders, spaces, time, and so forth. And it, with this cherubic smile where he invites the guy to sit down and have a meal with him, he was disarticulating that order, disarticulating those boundaries. He was literally dis-locating, dislocating that space. He was speaking from a place that is not merely in that restaurant. His was a place that doesn't have a place in the unity of places that is the Dutch legal order. And so he was not only breaching boundaries, he was also transgressing them. Now, this transgression of boundaries is what I call illegality. Illegality is behavior that is in breach of the law or that is perhaps within the law, but at the same time calls into question challenges the way the law distributes the distinction between legality and illegality. And as I say, this was the incident that got me to thinking about the problem of the relationship between legal order and boundaries. My attempt was to forget the heroic debates in legal theory, which are still taking place today, 
and try to think from the bottom up, beginning from the problem of boundaries. What does something like breaching boundaries and transgressing boundaries tell us about the structure of legal order in general? And if that was then for the sort of, as it were, for me, the aha e Leibniz, as the German would, Germans would put it, that got me going on this, on this first book. And I used globalization, the, the title is Fault Lines of Globalization. Um, I used globalization as a sort of negative foil. Negative foil in the sense that um, I wanted to ask the question, well, if this guy is coming from outside, it's not merely the outside in the sense, in the, in the conventional sense of inside outside, which we use in legal theory, that is to say, in terms of states, the domestic and the foreign. In a more fundamental sense, there is a distinction between inside and outside as the own and the strange. The play, the guy, where, when I asked the question, where was the guy coming from? It was from outside, but not only from the street. He was keep coming from a strange place. If I may be allowed to twist Foucault a bit, it's not merely a heterotopia, it is a xenotopia where he was speaking to us from, where he was smiling. And so I used globalization in this fir first book as a sort of negative foil to ask the question, can we imagine a, a global legal order which doesn't have an outside in this strong sense of a strange place? And my answer was no, not even human rights law. I think that any conceivable legal order that we could imagine would have an outside in this strange sense. But globalization there was an, a sort of, a, as I say, a negative foil that allowed me to enter a number of what I thought interesting philosophical questions. The second book is an attempt to not only use, use globalization as a negative foil for this general question, but to try to give a positive account of the structuring of legal orders under the conditions of globalization. In what way do emergent global legal orders both continue and transform our understanding of how legal orders posit spatial temporal, um, uh, spatial temporal subjective and, uh, and, and material boundaries. That's, that's at the core of the book. And what I do in this first chapter is begin with an example that is parallel to the example that I gave of the clochard, but is an example that draws on the WTO, which purports to have a sort of global validity. And it's an example of uh, a farmers association in India called the Karachaka, I believe, um, farmers uh, farmers the KRRS, it's a farmers association in the state in India, who enter uh, fields of Monsanto to destroy some of the genetically modified organisms that they were producing. And in fact, we're contesting not only Indian law, but also WTO law. Uh, on, uh, on that respect. So in a certain sense, my claim there was they are in that direct action, they're both within the WTO as a global market and they're outside it. And so what I'm doing there is trying to introduce uh, an important, the important distinction between, um, between two notions of boundaries, spatial boundaries, borders, and limits. And so the title of this new book is called Legal Authority and the Globalization of Inclusion and Exclusion. It's still a working title. I don't think it's snappy enough. I'm hoping for something better. If you have suggestions, I'd love it. Neil Walker, a good friend of mine, had suggested the limits of global law. But, but because we're running a, a project on global law, a BA in global law, the person who ran it looked at me in horror when I told her that this might be, please don't give that title to the book. We'll lose all our students right away. Um, but. Um, so I'm looking for a better title, but that gives you a sense what it's about. And I'm trying to write this book in a certain sense, uh, in a sort of collaboration with Saskia Sassen, who, as you may know, is one of the leading contemporary soci sociologists of globalization. Quite incisive. And I think that some of, the, of her basic insights are insights that I would definitely want to endorse. One of them being the idea that uh, if there's anything that globalization is not, is that we would be delocalizing globalization processes. She doesn't have that much to say about law, actually, something. But she looks at, for example, global cities and shows how a condition of possibility of globalization is the, its materialization, as she puts it, by necessity in places of which the global city is her paradigm. So in a certain sense, and in this, she's written a recent book that's called Expulsions, and showing how at the core of globalization, we no longer can understand it in terms of increasing inequalities 
but there is a sort of a dramatic process which is beyond just a question of disparities in equality or inequalities which are growing. It's now, in her understanding, a logic of expulsions which is taking place. Now, this process of expulsion is, of course, in, I think in a philosophical term, the problematic of inclusion and exclusion. What we're seeing is an exa exas exacerbated process of inclusion and exclusion which is taking place in globalization, both unification of law, but in the very process of the unification of law on a global scale, also processes of increasing expulsion or exclusion of people of legal orders. So that's what I want to make sense of. I want to make sense of that empirically, which means that I want to discuss the nitty gritty of a range of legal orders. So I spent the last week actually, most of my evenings going pouring through the user policy of eBay, just to try to make sense of how that legal order, which Kalias and Sumbansen, who as you would know, have this book, Rough Conse Running Cone and Rough Consensus, Kalias in particular has a strong claim that um, eBay is an autonomous legal order. And so I'm trying to make, so I'm looking at eBay, I'm looking at um, Lex Mercatoria, I'm looking at uh, the International Standards Organization, I'm looking at uh, the Basel Committee for Banking Supervision, I'm looking at, well, probably extremely boring materials for most legal philosophers, but are basically what law is about today in a globalizing context, to try to make sense of the processes of inclusion and exclusion that are taking place there, and try to pin down in what way those processes show continuities with, but also discontinuities with, processes of inclusion and exclusion that rely on borders, as we know them today, in states. So that's a bit of what this book is about. This is in the guise of an introduction. Let me say something about the structure of the book in general. So, sorry, I haven't finished. So first that's the empirical component. Then there's a conceptual component. I want to try and pin down a concept of law that will help me to make sense both of the continuities and this discontinuities. And that's what I toss out in this chapter, which you've seen. I'll get back to that in a minute. I'm also interested in normative issues. I'm interested in the question, okay, of the very notion of inclusion and exclusion is itself, of course, normatively laden. These are not terms that have, are more normatively neutral. Uh, what interests me is that basically so much of our thinking of normativity is actually very much, or very much presupposes problems of boundaries. Look at cosmopolitanism and look at communitarianism. Both cosmopolitanism and communitarianism, which are arguably the two core normative positions in terms of the debate about globalization, are views that presuppose a certain understanding of what the structure of boundaries are, is. And so both of these are strong normative projects, but neither cosmopolitanism nor communitarianism, in my view, or if you wish, universalism and particularism, have a compelling theory of the structure of boundaries, how boundaries do their work of including and excluding. And in my sense of the matter is that if you can get your finger behind what is the structure of boundaries, you have at least a window of access to a much stronger theory, normative theory, of, of globalizations. I'll get back to that at the end. So that's the introduction. Let me say something about the structure of the book in general. It's in the current um, planning, I have, I'm thinking of five chapters. The first chapter, as I've said, is introduces in a descriptive, descriptive manner this distinction between borders and limits. Borders being the external borders of, of, of a state and its territoriality, but limits being any spatial boundary, like in the example of the clochard, the, dur, the door that separates and joins the, the, the restaurant from the, uh, from the sidewalk, is a limit in my sense of the term because it shows the distinction between a place that a collective calls its own and a strange place, a xenotopia. And so I introduced that distinction, as I say, on the basis of this uh, WTO order and contestation by the KRRS. So that's the first chapter. Then there's the second chapter, which, is, which, what ha which Mike has been so kind as to circulate, and I'll come back to that at the end. I'll, I'll just leave it for what it is, where I introduce a concept of order that I think might help me explain uh, what happened with the WTO and with a range of other orders as well. Then I've, there's chapter three, which I've given the title, um, Three Variations on the Theme of Global Unification and Global Pluralization. Um, it's a chapter I've just finished, last week in fact. 
Um, and what I'm trying to do in this chapter is put this model of law which I've developed in chapter two to the test and run it across a range of, uh, of examples of what are putative emergent global legal orders to see if it works. I think it works. I'm not completely sure yet, but I think it works. And I'm trying to do that from three different perspectives. Um, because I think that the problem, and, and what's at the core of this chapter is a problem of unity, the unity of legal orders. Of course, positivist legal positivism, in many ways rightly so, has obsessed with the problem of the unity of law. How can you make sense of a unity of a manifold of norms? You've got the, Cal you've got the Kelsenian perspective with the Gund norm, you've got the, 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 the Hart perspective, even in his own way, Dworkin, the problem of unity remains, I think, of central importance to his thinking. You've also got, of course, systems theory. Systems theoretical perspectives on unity are different to that of those of, um, say, the Anglo-Saxon debate, but also there the problem of the unity of law is of capital importance for systems theory. Look at Teubner's work. So I, my, my take on it is that if we view law, as my argument is, that it's a form of collective action, this allows us to make sense of the problem of unity from three different perspectives. First, from the perspective of a we. To speak of a we that acts together is to already presuppose something like a group that acts as a unit. And so there my question is, what does it mean to say we together in the framework of the law? What kinds of understanding of unity are at stake here? And I distinguish between three different repositions, the we speaker, the we at stake, and the authorial we. Then I move into the notion of legal system, which is much closer to the conventional contemporary debate within legal and uh, within legal positivism about uh, the law as a, as a unity of a of, of, of manifold of norms. And there I um, distinguish between what I call means ends and functional coherence. And then there's the notion that I borrow from Schmidt. Forgive me for uh, using Schmidt. He's not, one is not supposed to use Schmidt. And of course, uh, any well-thinking liberal will do anything but uh, refer to Schmidt. The problem is that the guy's brilliant. Can't, can't say anything other than that. And of course, what makes him such a treacherous author is that you can't easily distinguish between where he's right and where he's wrong. When you take on Schmidt, you, in a certain sense, take him on hook, line, and sinker, which means that there where he's right, he's also wrong. But I think that he's in any case right in making sense of law, or certainly at least of state law, as being a concrete order. And one of the things that he has in mind when speaking about law as a concrete order is the distinction between inside and outside as being constitutive for legal orders. When he speaks about the distinction between inside and outside, he very much has in mind the distinction between the own and the strange. For those of you who, are, who have read um, the concept of the political, you remember that he um, renders the notion of the enemy equivalent to the notion of the stranger. Now, my take on it is precisely to take these apart. One of the modalities of the enemy is, of the stranger is the enemy, but the stranger is a more primordial, more fundamental category and not everything that is strange is an enemy. The clochard was strange, but he wasn't an enemy. And so I want to use this more fundamental sense of concrete order, which is vaguely visible in Schmidt, but which he very quickly collapses into the enemy-friend distinction, to try to make sense of the concreteness of law. The fact that we are always literally in the law, phenomenologically speaking, in the sense that a legal order, in terms of its norms, are sort of guide posts to help us orient ourselves in space, in time, subjectivity, and act contents. And so what I do there is map out uh, from these three different dimensions, some of the legal orders that I've mentioned, cyber law, in particular eBay, and to a certain extent ICANN, Lex Mercatoria, Le Codex Alimentarius, uh, Global Administrative Law, a very interesting or outfit called the Clean Clothes Campaign, which is an entirely private outfit which has set up a code to regulate uh, the apparel and sportswear industry. Um, accounting firms and the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. I'm trying to show in what way in each one of these legal orders 
uh, the problem of unity comes to the fore. Then in chapter four, which I've, I've given, um, it's what the problem there is the problem of counter globalization. And I've given it the um, provisional title, the Anomos of the Earth. You will, of course, you may know that one of uh, Schmidt's last books was called Nomos der Erde, Nomos of the Earth. And what uh, Schmidt means by nomos is two things. Nomos is on the one hand going back, harking back to the notion, the, the, the more primordial no, the notion of nomos in Greece, which was not simply convention. So the, we, have, we know nomos has a distinction between nomos and phrusis, no, uh, convention and, and, and nature. But before nomos meant convention, it meant something in, in terms of um, the relationship between space and normativity. Now, what's fascinating in Schmidt is that he draws on this understanding of nomos and speaks of the nomos of the earth, but that's one of the senses of nomos. Second sense of nomos that he uses, he, he draws a sort of specious, spurious uh, relationship between the uh, Greek verb nemein and the, the German uh, verb nehmen, which means to take. And he says that law always begins with a taking, literally taking place unless you grab land, or for that matter, the seas, you haven't got a legal order going yet. If you want a recent confirmation, think of Occupy Wall Street. The very, very word Occupy in Occupy Wall Street already refers to that notion of taking. It didn't, was, didn't manage to be successful. But the very idea of that you have to actually occupy a place and from there out begin to set up a legal order is something that Schmidt dwells on. Now, I want to use that title, but I want to use the title in a different way by speaking of an a nomos, where the a particle in Greek doesn't mean simply the negation of nomos, but it speaks to another nomos, another place which is not in the place that is taken. It seems to me that this is the notion of a counter-globalization. And so, so in other words, what I want to try and do is explore a number of xenotopias, which I see emerging in the process of contesting the globalization of capitalism, the nomos of the earth, which is capitalism today. And so empirically, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hopefully uh, sometime next, uh, next week, begin to explore uh, movements like the Via Campesina, the pe peasant movement of Latin America, and not only of Latin America, that are contesting in their own way processes of globalization. I'm going to look into the Zapatista movement in Mexico has been doing that. They have been doing soft, very interesting things. I'm also going to look into the subaltern studies movement in India. And I'm not only interested in the, in the processes by which in the contestation of globalization, you create different understandings of what law is. I'm also interested to what an extent these movements of counter globalization are also calling into question our own Western understanding of what law is. To what an extent do people such as the people that are working in the subaltern studies in India, are they articulating in their own way a concept of law, which would be quite different to the kinds of debates that we're holding within Western uh, uh, academia about the concept of law. And so in that sense, I'm putting to the test my own model because I have absolutely no um, illusions that I'm stepping out, the, out of the Western tradition in thinking about law. I'm thoroughly Western in my thinking about law. In what way are these people contesting what I have to say about law? Then there's a fifth chapter, um, which I've given the very bland provisional title, Legal Authority and Globalization. And it begins with a, a phenomenological gambit. And that is the distinction between the notions of globe and world. Um, of course, in everyday language, we use the terms interchangeably. Um, so the double, if you look at the WTO's webpage, you will see that it presents itself as we are the WTO, and then it says that we are the leading global organization that handles blah, blah, blah. So globe and world there are on, literally on one sentence as synonyms interchangeable terms. Now, at a certain even, so we could say world law and global law are the same thing, but in English at least, the first of the terms, global law has obtained currency, whereas the second has. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, as long as it, we place it, we deal with those notions at that level. 
The problems begin when we take for granted that the world needs a legal order that doesn't have an outside. I think that's what contestation in its multifarious forms of the WTO makes absolutely clear. And I think this is where phenomenology has something interesting to say. For phenomenology, the notions of globe and world are fundamentally different. It's a category distinction. For phenomenology, the globe is simply a very large thing. It's so large that none of us can actually see it, not even if you're out there on a, in, a, in a cockpit of, a, of, a, of a, you know, one of these Sputniks or whatever. Um, the world is not a thing. For phenomenology, the world is a plexus of meaning relations that opens up the possibility of things to appear as they appear. So literally, um, the universe is in the world of an astronomer. Although, in our everyday understanding of it, of course, the world is in the universe. And so what I want to try to make sense of is, in what sense is the notion of the world, in this strong phenomenological sense, at issue in our understandings of global law? And the way to do that in terms of the theories of collective action is in to introduce the problem of the background. Uh, the background, collective action never only emerges uh, out of itself, uh, ex nihilo. It always leads back to a broader plexus of relationships from which it draws its meaning. And actually quite different philosophers have pointed this out. One is, for example, John Searle. Uh, in his uh, lovely book on the construction of social reality, there's a chapter on what he calls background abilities. But of course also Heidegger in Sein und Zeit refers continuously to the notion of a background, which is for him the window to enter the discussion of the notion of the world. And so I'm going to use um, this notion of the world to uh, set up a sort of debate between uh, universalism, particularism, if you want to call it in its conventional terms, communitarianism, cosmopolitanism, and what I would want to call a third way, which has nothing to do with our friend Blair, um, what I would call entwinements. And there I'm using the notion of a chiasm, which was introduced by Merleau-Ponty, who, who, who himself got it from Paul Valéry, the famous uh, 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 French uh, writer. And the notion of, of, of a chiasma speaks of a notion of a, of a certain intertwinement. It's not hybridity. So Stuart Hall has nothing to tell us here. It's a, a intertwinement. And what I want to say with that is, uh, it sounds a bit like a word, play in words, but it is anything but. It's not merely that boundaries include and exclude. It's that boundaries include what they exclude, and also that they exclude what they include. And so this makes for entwinements, it makes it possible to mediate between worlds, but never to have an all-encompassing world, but neither also simply like billiard balls, as communitarians would have us, different worlds. So in some senses, I'm close to an agonistic theory of law. In some ways I can meet, and I've worked, I've worked quite closely at, at a certain point with, with Chantal Mou at Westminster, but it seems to me that there is no real strong normative project in the thinking of political agonism a la, a la Mouffe or a la Laclau. And so I'm looking for an alternative that is um, strongly normative, and I'm looking for it in what I would call asymmetrical recognition. So this final chapter will be basically a discussion with a range of uh, recognition theories, beginning with Axel Hornet, but in no ways ending there. Do I have five minutes still? Yeah. Okay, so let me just say a couple of things about this chapter, and then we can move into the discussion. Um, my main thesis in this book is that um, I think we, one good way of looking at law is viewing it as a species of collective action. And uh, what I'm doing here is basically working and carrying forward ideas that have already been developed within analytical philosophy by people such as Bradman, Pettit, Tuomela, and, um, and uh, Margaret Gilbert. We actually had Margaret Gilbert last year, two years before, two years back in Tilburg for a, for a discussion about these issues. And Gilbert has a very lovely distinction between we each and we together. So to, um, and so the claim would be law is about we together, not about we each. So get, to give you a sense of the distinction, imagine that, um, that we were at a, at, a, at a train station, central station here in Toronto, all of us. We didn't know each other. Each one of us was just going his or her own way. 
and there was a Martian who just zoomed in from outer space. Never seen a train station, didn't, didn't know what was happening with all of these people milling around there on the platform. And so he taps Mike's, or she, well, gender neutral. It, the Swedes actually now have a gender neutral term that they're teaching children at school. Uh, so it wouldn't be it. I don't know what it would be the equivalent of, but let's say it's it. Okay, let's say it's E.T. So E.T. Um, uh, taps your shoulder and says, what are you all doing? So you would say, well, we're waiting for the train. Suppose that the train arrives. Suppose I, I, I really enjoy my, my joints and there's no police agent around. So just before the train is ready to leave, being Dutch and be, being very laid back about these things, I want to have a last joint. And so everyone steps on board the, the train. The doors are ready to close. And I haven't noticed it because I've turned my back. I did see that there was actually a police agent a ways back there. So, you know, I'm just puffing on the other direction. And all of you are just, you know, already seated and waiting for the, what, what, what the inevitable to happen, which is that the doors will close, the train will leave, and I'll say, damn, I lost the train. And I'll spin around, look at the train, and all of you will wave at me. And of course, I can be angry about it, but you don't have any obligations towards me to, uh, to say, to, uh, you know, say the doors were closing. But imagine that we were at Central Station in Toronto and we were going to go wherever, to the Niagara Falls. Well, if we were going to go together and I was having my joint and um, you hadn't, I hadn't noticed that the train was leaving, you would be in your obligation to advise me about the fact that the train was leaving. Why? Because we were doing this together. If you're doing something together, that creates rights and obligations between participants to do what it takes to bring that, to pull off that joint act. Now, the assumption is that law is about we together. It's not only about we together, but any meaningful understanding of what law is is trying to disambiguate that notion of we together in such a way that you end up with an understanding of what law is about. And that's the track I'm taking. And I'm doing it in a way that, as I say, tries to mediate between phenomenology and collective action theory. I'm also doing it in some ways close to what Shapiro is doing in Yale. If there's his famous book of his called Legality. I think that book has terrific insights. I think it has also terrifically problematic. I just don't see the normative project there. Um, and I think that I can, there's more to the book that I can use than what than, than I, I would want to turn my back on. So, but I'm trying to work in this direction. And so what this chapter does is unveil this understanding of, um, of collective action, which I'm doing, working out. And it, I build it up in three steps. The first is the notion of collective action in general. Then the notion of authoritativeness, but in a functional sense of authority, not a normative sense, that comes later. And then the third part is uh, the notion of institutionalization. And there I'm happy to work uh, to agree with, uh, with uh, the Shapiro that law does not take on the forms of what Bradman calls modest sociality, which is a small group, a thick group like this one perhaps. A lot of what goes by the name of law involves forms of collective action that are very anonymous and where people are sometimes alienated from the, joint, the point of joint action. So I'm working, I'm working out a concept of law in that direction. And then what I'm trying to do is apply it to certain aspects of the globalization debate, um, certain features of globalization. So for example, the marketization, the fragmentation of, of law, which, which we see unfolding before our eyes. And particularly, which I find fascinating, the process of compression of space and time, which so many authors refer to, amongst others, David Harvey, but uh, other people as well. Um, and so I end up then uh, preparing the ground for the third chapter, which is introducing the problem of unity and mapping out how that works in, um, in a range of, of emerging global legal orders. I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so we have um, 45 minutes or so for, for discussion. So I should explain, I always forget to do this. Um, uh, for those, because I know some of you come regularly and some of you you don't, uh, uh, I'll be s s scanning the room. Just put your 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 hand up uh, for a question, uh, and I'll start making a cue. Uh, so if you see me again, like staring at you, it's you know I'm just trying to see if you're if you're nodding, you know, sort of nodding to for asking a question or, or so on. Yeah. Russell, you criticize uh, Shapiro's legality. Um, in passing by saying, well, I don't see the normative project here. What is your normative project? Because what I've been hearing is much more of a kind of a descriptive sociological attempt at grasping with the phenomenon than giving me any kind of 
prescription for how things should be, right? So, so how does? Mind if I right? write down the questions because I'll be happy. Oh, please. Yeah. Because I understand that yeah. the Shapiro's project is not a normal, as I said, yeah. he's trying to tell us what law of course. is, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So. so he wouldn't want to have one, right. exactly. Why, um, so it's not, it, I'm not taking him to task for that. I'm, what interests me is um, um, if you work out from a notion of collective action, uh, is there a normative, an implicit, implicit normative project which would emerge from a theory of collective action? And of course, most of collective action theory has been very analytical. So if you look at people such as, as, um, as Bradman, there's some uh, understanding of, 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 of normativity there, but it's, it's, it's a quite mellow, quite mute, muted account of it. It becomes much stronger when you look at people such as, as Margaret Gilbert. If you look at her theory of political obligations, there's a strong, actually, social contractarian approach to collective action theory. Uh, if you look at Pettit, uh, in uh, his earlier book on the theory of freedom, there's a very strong uh, a normative project there on the collectivization of reason and reason as discourse, and uh, very much in line of republicanism as, 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 as uh, absence of domination. So my first point would be to say Shapiro, probably wisely within a positivist perspective, wants to steer clear of that. Um, I don't. I do want to engage in a normative project, but at this initial stage of the, of, of the book, I want to remain at the level of a quite functional understanding of authority. So, as I understand authority as in, in, this, in, this, um, in this chapter, it has to do with what I call the articulation, with the monitoring, and with the upholding of, of, of behavior and of the point of, of collective action. Now, that basically is normatively uh, a, no, no project whatsoever yet. It's functional. Now, where will the normativity come in and which way do I want to take it? Um, it will come in at the end when I want to might try to make sense of a strong sense of authority, what I'm doing now in this third chapter is beginning with this functional understanding of authority and show how, at the end of the day, this functional understanding of authority calls normative questions about authority into, the, into view. And how does it do it generally? Well, the very notion of collective action implies a claim to commonality. And so to the extent that there are claims made in terms of, on behalf of a collective and of acting together, the, the very notion of togetherness already suggests the possibility of something like, like a normative project. Which way would that normative project take you? It would take you in, di in the re directions of thinking of notions such as reciprocity, take you in, in the direction of thinking, think of thinking of notions such as equality. But in my particular case, what I find interesting there is a normative project in terms of the problem of setting boundaries. How do you set boundaries? How and who do you include and exclude? And there's where I think that the notion of recognition uh, is of interest. Um, if you look at the work of Axel Honneth, who's probably the most uh, important contemporary theoretician of recognition theory, basically it's a very um, emancipatory understanding of, of normativity, very uh, very Hegelian, of course. He is a thoroughly Hegelian uh, 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 author. And basically his understanding of it is an understanding of, of, of recognition as a normative project, as a process of inclusion of the other. That is to say, the other who challenges the way we have drawn boundaries, and that in that process of responding to the challenge of the other and of the difference, what you recognize is that there is a more fundamental equality between those who are outside and those who are inside, and that therefore in the process of resetting boundaries to the extent that that is a normative project, you're trying to articulate what is common in a way that both respects the difference and allows for that, that which has been excluded to be included within the legal order. In some ways, I think that uh, the project of, of Honet and the project of Charles Taylor are not, not so radically different. Both are theoreticians of recognition, both are theoreticians of recognition that would probably be prepared to view the, the, the aspect of boundary setting as central to their own understanding of what recognition is about. Now, these will be the people I will be engaging with. But I, I would want to take it I, what I think is one step further. Um, I would say that recognition is nev never only a process of recognition of the other. I would say that there's always also an element of misrecognition involved in 
processes of recognition. And therefore, uh, what I want to try to think of is what understanding of normativity is still available to us if recognition is not merely a process of ever increasing the generality of a legal order, which so ever more encompassing. But if what you are doing is mediating uh, boundaries without there ever being a fully encompassing legal order, what remains for normativity if that is the case? Because the, the, uh, the analysis of normativity that uh, Honet and, say, Taylor do, but also Jim Tully here, Jim is actually quite close to that, even if he's agonistic, um, is, 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 is at the first, uh, the first instance, I think, a much stronger case because it, it offers a compelling picture of what emancipation would be about in a modern understanding of the contingency of boundaries. But I don't think that it, that it, that it is sufficiently um, uh, cognizant of the fact that boundaries don't, don't merely include what they exclude. My addition would be that they also exclude what they include. So, um, for example, some of the issues that I've, I tried to discuss, I've discussed in this earlier book, is a problem of civil disobedience. So, civil disobedience are those kinds of, of, of issues that I think that political liberal theory can deal with fairly easily. But I, what I tried to show in this book is that there are um, cases which are no longer cases of, of civil disobedience in the liberal paradigm, which raise normative issues which are extremely difficult to deal with. Um, do you want me to give a concrete example? Yeah. Um, I've written a separate article on the famous Quebec secession reference. Il faudrait parler français pour... Uh, <laughs> so, uh, of course, this, the Canadian secession reference has been a, 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 a brilliant example of a progressive court in its attempt to, um, to uh, create a space for discussion about secession. Um, in a way that recognizes a certain otherness of the Quebecois. And, uh, but in the, in the same process, also trying to um, guarantee its role as uh, the Hüter der Verfassung, as the Germans would put it, the guardian of the constitution uh, of Canada. Now, what's, what's, I was actually in contact with quite a few, several colleagues, one of them Chevalier in Quebec, in the University of Quebec about this. And, um, if you unpack the Quebec secession reference, what's interesting about it is that it's it, precisely because it's the, it's the ruling of a progressive court, it's a lot more interesting than the ruling of, say, the, the, the Spanish court now in, with, with Catalonia, because that's a, that's a very reactionary court. So then it's easy to write off the, 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 the Spanish court because it's reactionary. But with a progressive court, you see the limits of what legal thinking can do. Now, what's interesting in the case of, of the Quebec secession reference is that at the end of the day, for the Canadian court, its answer was, in, in, with respect to the, the question of, of, of the Trudeau government, is there a right to unilateral secession? The court's answer, without saying so explicitly, was no, because that's an oxymoron. If there is secession, if you have a right, then you cannot have a unilateral right to secession. It has to take place on the basis of a dialogue between the, between the different provinces and so forth. So anything like a unilateral right to secession is, a, um, is, a, is, is an oxymoron. And what it does is that at a certain passage, it has a sort of abridged history of the emergence of Canada. Now, what I talked about with these Chevalier and these other guys in, in Quebec was uh, that they felt that it was a very cavalier history of the, of the emergence of Canada. And what it boils down to in terms of collection, collective action theory is this. As Bernhard Waldenfels, a contemporary a German phenomenologist who I work with, puts it, he says, uh, but also Émile Bonveniste, a well-known uh, French linguist, uh, we cannot say we. Someone has to say we on behalf of the we. But whoever says we on behalf of the we does so prematurely and by definition without having the right to do so. And so... What you can show quite clearly is how, in a certain sense, this gets papered over in the, um, in the, in the, in the Quebec secession reference in such a way that it's taken for granted that the Quebecois had agreed to uh, being part of Canada. And that all of those who came after them, by, by dint of that original agreement, did also. But is that the case? 
And it's not, of course, not only the case for the Quebecois, it's also the case for the First Peoples. And so if it is the case that someone has to say we for the we, if you're going to get collective action going, and if you're prepared, if push comes to shove, to exercise coercive action, what happens with those people who say, but wait a minute, if it would be an oxymoron to speak about a unilateral right to secession, if this had been an act of consent. But for many people in what is today the province of Quebec, there was no talk of, 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 of consent, not at all. And so it's not, a, it's not an oxymoron at all. You're taking for granted that I'm part of Canada, whereas I've never understood myself, and our forebears have never understood themselves as being part of Canada. Now, you don't have to agree with that. But what is interesting here is a systematic point a collective gets going with an act that is not itself a reciprocal act. It gets act going with an act of representation, which by definition cannot have been authorized to that effect. And what I think is the saving grace of the Quebec secession reference is the fact that at the very end, it seems to me that the court recognizes this and says, OK, I cannot but act on behalf of Canada. But were it the case that there is a significant majority that wants out in Quebec, then in a certain sense, the conditions for majority decision-making under the terms of the Canadian Constitution would be suspended. I'm speaking about things that you guys already know, of course. And then you would have to have a political dialogue between people that have to reach some kind of an agreement about how they get out or how they go on further. Now, what was interesting there is that this is Karl Schmitt's inverted state of exception. For Karl Schmitt, the state of exception is a situation where because you have reached the limits of what can be said within that legal order, then basically you have to crush those who want out. In a certain sense, the court was also recognizing a state of exception if there were a majority vote, but was taking what I would say is precisely the right normative position. And is to say, at that moment, not all the Canadian constitution is, 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 is suspended, human rights aren't suspended, but you are suspending rules of majority rule so that you can have a political dialogue. Now, it's trying to think through what are the normative frameworks that will allow us to think of these kinds of solutions to problems, which at the end of the day is what I want to end up discussing in, in the book. Don't press me too much on this because I haven't reached that yet, but that's the direction I want to take the discussion. I'm not quite sure what my question is. Um, so I, it, it just something that you said piqued my interest. You said that um, legal orders include what they exclude, they mm -hmm. exclude what they include, mm -hmm. and you think of this as intertwined. Mm -hmm. So the, what's included and what's excluded are intertwined for you. Mm -hmm. um, what do you mean by intertwine? Do you mean that they somehow overlap? Do you mm -hmm. mean they somehow mm -hmm. integrate? Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. is, is it just a superficial because the legal order has to take them both under consideration and it, it, they just happen to, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. good. But, sorry. <laughs> good, yeah. Gives me a chance to explain what, what otherwise is probably an extremely obscure uh, expression. What does that mean? Include what you exclude, exclude yeah, what you exclude. Let me, let me get, get going with that, <laughs> try to illustrate that, and then we can begin to think about what intertwinement means. Um, um, <laughs> Let me give a concrete example of what I mean by that paradoxical structure of boundaries. Um, the European Union. Um, if you look at, at the Treaty of Rome, which got it going, basically it begins with a fascinating, uh, with a fascinating um, move, uh, which gets me back to, to this point that I was discussing with you. Uh, we cannot say we. Uh, there is this famous sort of mantra, which is the mantra that for the Brits, incidentally, is precisely anathema, what they want out from. And that's the expression an ever closer union among the peoples of Europe. And so that's a, that's, that's a, that's a consideration which always returns in the, in the, different, um, in the different treaties. Uh, we are uh, the, the, uh, the, the signatories are determined to create an ever closer union among the peoples of Europe. Now, people such as Joe Weiler and a host of, of European law scholars have hammered on the fact, do you see? It's not we the people do hereby ordain, it's the peoples of Europe are, would like to carry on further together into the future, but definitely we do not want to become the United States of Europe. And he's right. And all of the people that say what's fascinating about the European project is of course that it, we are not going to become states 
in the, in the in, in, uh, American sense of the term, not going to become provinces, the idea is that there do remain states war, which remain within a sphere of, 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 of the law, autonomous, relatively autonomous. So there has been so much said about the plurality of the European project. But of course, at the same time, it's not only a question of plurality, it's also a question of unity. Because look at what it's saying, an ever closer union. That is to say, there is a presupposition that there already is a unity of the peoples of Europe. And of course, Europe is not merely a geographical space. It's an open secret that Europe, it, the boundaries of Europe are bogus. Whoever said that the, the Ural uh, mountain range could count as, 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 as a boundary? And if it does, well, then you've got all of European Russia on board and you've got European Russia. Why don't you go as far as Vladivostok? And if you go as far as Vladivostok, why don't you bring in the North Koreans? And of course, the real case is now, today, Turkey. As you may know, the price that they're beginning to pay now for trying to deal with the immigration problem is um, allowing Turkey finally to join. Now, which shows that the boundaries of Europe are normative boundaries to, from the very beginning, and that there is something like a people of Europe, even if that doesn't foreclose the possibility of peoples of Europe in the plural. So there is a reference to a Europe that was already there in the past, and that we are giving legal form to, even if giving legal form to that people of Europe, which is a people in a very different sense to the notion of a nation state people, involves making sure that we have plurality and we don't become a mega state. Now, that's the first step. So there you've got a boundary between Europe and non-Europe, those who are included and those who are excluded. And the way that boundary is drawn, certainly the Treaty of Rome, it has widened since then, is basically we view ourselves as Europeans for the purpose of creating a common market. And the technical term has now become an internal market, but initially well, the notion was a common, but of course even that common market was an internal market. So you've already drawn the distinction between inside and outside. So here you have the basic understanding of what boundaries do. They include and they exclude. But they do more than that. Because in the very process of saying that Europe closes itself off as an inside vis-a-vis -vis an outside, the, an internal market vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world that becomes an external market, you both include Europe and what you exclude, the external market, in a global market. So the external boundaries of Europe don't only include Europe and exclude the rest of the world, they also include what they have excluded in a global market. There's the first part of that riddle. But the second part, it's not only that boundaries include what they exclude, boundaries also exclude what they include. In the very process of saying that what we Europeans are about is creating a common market, and that doesn't, meet, uh, that doesn't have to stink when we say the word market. If you look at the Treaty of Rome and the way it's been amplified afterwards, it, it's a market that has to fulfill a number of criteria. Gender equality, sustainability, it's, it's a rich normative project. Now, of course, even if it's a rich normative project, it remains a project that is based on the notion of a market, and not only a market, a capitalist market. So in the very process of including Europe as a, as a market, you're excluding other possible understandings of what Europe could be about. And so you get then these European social forums, for example, in Malmö in Sweden, a couple of years back, saying another Sweden, another, another Europe is possible. And so what you see happening there is that not only does Europe, the boundaries of the European Union, include Europe and exclude the world, the rest of the world, they also exclude other, other understandings of what Europe are about in the very process of including Europe. And they exclude other understandings of what the world is about in viewing the world as a global market. So this is what I want to say is the, the, the basic idea I want to try to develop normatively. Boundaries don't only include and exclude, it's more difficult than that. They include what they exclude, and they exclude what they include. Now, if that is the case, what does this tell us about the structure of an entwinement? It's not overlapping, because oh, in the sense of a Rawlsian overlapping consensus. In a certain sense, I think that's too easy. What's, what is proper, <coughs> proper to the notion of a, uh, God bless you, um, what is, what is um, proper to the notion of an entwinement is that you have a boundary 
which is in a certain sense joining and separating uh, parties, but in such a way that none of the two actually owns the boundary. And to make this quite, quite concrete, um, the immigrants who are coming to Europe today, they don't care if they're going to Europe or if they're going to Italy or if they're going to Greece or if they're going to Europe. So we become Europe first and foremost in the eyes of someone else. And it is in the process of responding to people who come and creating boundaries and creating these institutions such as Frontex, which is actually interception, intercepting the boats now on the borders, on, on, in the territorial waters of, of northern African countries, that we actually become something like a we. So can we say that the borders of Europe are our borders or are they borders that others uh, create for us? That's what I want to make sense of as an intertwinement. Try to imagine what it would be to have a normative project that takes for granted that boundaries are never our own boundaries only. They're also the other's boundaries. Does that help? Okay. I'm trying to postpone, as you understand, I'm speaking a great deal to postpone this further question. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Bro, we're not, um, we're recording the, the discussion as well, so make sure you get a microphone. Um, okay. So, um, I'll try a, a somewhat different direction. To, okay. so, I'm, I'm, so it's not so much a, a, a challenge or uh, but rather maybe an attempt to, to draw your attention to mm -hmm. to something else so so you actually started by saying i'm not interested in the hard work in debates etc and, and 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 i agree with that i mean they're to me kind of overdone and not very interesting and uh, and so on but there is a sense that much of analytic jurisprudence is concerned with the project of boundaries as well which is sort of actually related to the the one you started talking about in your in your story because uh, much of the project, and that's in fact what Shapiro, I think, would see as his project, which he sees as continuing with all the way to heart, is to, um, but definitely it's, it's more prominent in, in sort of contemporary legal positivists, is the idea that, yeah, there are lots of normative orders out there, uh, but only some of them are legal. Um, and... Uh, and so there is a, a boundaries project there yeah. and of one of yeah. inclusion, inclusion and exclusion yeah. there. Uh, yeah. So um, in fact, if I may kind of throw in something uh, of my own work. So I have a paper that's called uh, uh, the, the purpose of legal, uh, the boundaries of the boundaries of law and the, and the purpose of legal philosophy. And, and I kind of criticize the, all, all this project, but, but, but the idea that, that much of legal philosophy uh, of the kind that you're kind of putting aside is concerned with with boundaries is actually a very uh, central aspect or, or angle to it. So I kind yeah. of wonder, yeah. um, um, how do you relate to that enterprise uh, of which Shapiro is, is a modern exponent, but, but many others, uh, um, and in a way, one way, in a way in which you could see the debate between positivists and Dworkin is, uh, and you see this in, in, for example, Raz's 1972 article is called Legal Positivism and the Limits of Law. And, and part of his attack there on Dworkin is saying legal positivism is the project that, that separates law from non-law in a clear way. And what's notable about Dworkin is that there's no such distinction in his, in his work. Um, so I wonder in what way do, does your project, uh, the normative one, relate to, to, to that uh, yeah. project? Yeah. Terrific. That's a very lucid question. Gives me a chance to uh, uh, redress, uh, well, you're a tort man, so to neminem ladere, don't cause any harm. So let me, uh, let me re re recant, not recant, but retract a bit and pull back a bit. Um, of course, I'm interested in the heart and, uh, and, and a, a Dworkin debate. Of course, I'm interested in Kelsen. I'm, I'm, if, I, if I look at the intensity of the debate on a democracy between uh, Kelsen and Schmidt, we don't have anything like that today. I mean, these guys, it was life and death for these guys, literally. Uh, as you may know, Kelsen had to flee to Geneva 
and then went off to Berkeley and never returned. Uh, and you may know about the background of the, their tussles in uh, Cologne. So, of course, I'm interested in these debates, and I'm a, I'm a sort of a crypto Kelsenian. Let me let me let me say so right away. More precisely, I think that there's a phenomenological read to be given of Kelsen, which makes Kelsen a lot more interesting than what a lot of the contemporary readings are. And of course, Hart is, uh, and, and that debate is interesting. Where where do I view myself as doing something that is related and different? Um, there's this essay of, Ra of Raz's uh, in his authority book. I think that's called The Identity of Legal Orders. Yes? Now, what's interesting there is that, of course, Raz and Hart and Kelsen and um, uh, all of these authors and their epigones are developing, in terms of that conventional distinction, the question about the identity of law. That is to say, what is specific, what allows us to pick out an order as a legal order, vis-a-vis -vis other orders. Now, to the extent that I'm asking the, the question, what, what, what concept of law would allow us to make sense both of continuities and discontinuities between state and, um, and emerging legal orders, I am moving within that identity question, sure. Of course. So it's the boundary, if you want to call it, between law and non-law. Um, but there's a second question, which Raz and Twining, for example, also in his recent book on globalization, a general jurisprudence, he also makes a distinction. There's, he, he, Twining has a three-way distinction. The question about the identity of law, the question about individuation. How can you pick out a legal order as being, say, the Canadian legal order, or the French, or the Dutch, or a First Nation legal order? And there's what he calls a taxonomic question, the question of what kinds of relevant and interesting distinctions can you make between legal orders? I think it's fair to say that what legal theory has obsessed on is the first question, the identity question, in this sense of it. What's specific to a legal order? And I'm happy to participate uh, in that obsession. But my take is I want to shift the ground of the debate. I don't want to begin in a certain sense, or at least in the earlier book, I don't want to begin with the question of identity. I want to begin with the question of individuation. Because if you look at this essay of Raz's, on a, uh, and, uh, I think it's called The Identity of Legal Orders in the Authority Book, he explicitly says, that the question about whether a legal order is a question is a French legal order or whether it's a, a Canadian legal order, that's a question for sociologists. That has that's an empirical claim that has little or nothing to do with the understanding of what law is in itself. If I may be allowed to put it in polite English, bullshit. My claim would be that that the individuation question is at the very core of the concept of law, because if what law is about is about drawing boundaries in a specific way, then it is the case that what, indiv what makes individuation possible is the fact that legal orders are bounded in space, time, subjectivity, and act content. And that um, if we begin with the problem of individuation, which too quickly is pushed out into the field of, um, of, of legal sociology and law, so so uh, law and society uh, discussions, then, in fact, you have an interesting take on the notion of legal order, but also in that understanding of the notion of identity, which is used in, uh, in legal positivism. So I'm not uh, 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 disavowing the main legal philosophical question. I just think that there's another, perhaps a, a different avenue of approach, which doesn't simply take us back into the identity question, which opens up a domain for new questions which are simply not being asked in the theories of, of of identity of legal order. To begin with, these, this notion of identity is an impoverished understanding of our identity. Paul Ricoeur, in his book, uh, Soi même comme un autre, One Self as Another, rightly says that there are two concepts of identity uh, at stake in personal identity, selfhood and sameness, ipse and idem identity. And what I would want to say is that if you begin with the notion of law as uh, individuation, then the notion of individuation presupposes precisely that notion of selfhood, in addition to the notion of sameness. And if you begin with this, which means introducing the notion of collective action, then you get an interesting take on the notion of the identity of legal orders in the positivistic understanding of it. I should say this is actually a first. I just wanted to, to note where Hart and Raz and Dworkin were left explicitly off of the Mm -hmm. you know, like the radar and the framework, and it's Danny of all people who brought them back into the discussion. So. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, so 
they are definitely there, but... Um, it's a rare accomplishment. Yeah, okay, terrific. Um, but it's, um, let me put it this way. One of the, I got one of the, one of the gripes that I had was, well, why aren't you engaging with these guys? And I, well, I said, well, you know, the contract was 450,000 words and it's already 160. I have a systematic problem. Uh, I don't have a, I, I will ha be happy to, to engage with these people, but I will also want to engage with Teubner. We've already have a couple of sparring, sparring matches. And I want to get back to the discussion with him because of course, if there's any, even more so in a certain sense than, uh, than, than legal positivism, if there's any legal theory that really takes a problem of boundary seriously, it's, it's systems theory. The very notion of a system presupposes the distinction between system and world or, or Umwelt as he calls it. Now, um, and of course that has to do with the autopoiesis and stuff. But what's fascinating with systems theory is that the notion of spatial boundaries is, has no uh, systematic significance for Luhmann, and therefore not, it doesn't either for, for Teubner. If you remember in social systems, Luhmann will speak about the three-way distinction of the, uh, dimensions of meaning, the social dimension, the temporal dimension, and the factual dimension. But he doesn't introduce a problem of spatial boundaries. That's only for politics, but why? Because of course a strategic decision at the heart of uh, systems theory is to go for communication as a basic unit of order rather than action. The moment that you go for communication rather than action, then you've already filtered out action by embodied beings and therefore a relationship to space as being constitutive for the possibility of a legal order. So that's my debate with, with Teubner. interesting talk I, what, what I'm trying I'm gonna try to articulate a question I, I don't know a lot about the problems of inclusion of exclusion but my question is going is is focused on on the on the sort of uh, of the foundation of the explanatory account you provide you, uh, I have the sense that when you try to account for social uh, uh, collective social action so you are focused on the idea of borders in order to know how, uh, uh, what is a collective so social art action and how does it work? We look at, at, at the borders, how the collective social art does differentiate between subjects, objects, space, and times. And that's what, when we have this clear idea about which are the borders of the, of, the, of the collective social action, about what is in and what is out, we can then provide a, 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 a explanation. So the, the idea of border seems to be the key idea, but what if, there is no border, or what if the borders are not so clear? I'm thinking in Aristotle's idea of friendship. This is what I have in mind. For Aristotle, we don't have a clear idea of what is friendship or non-friendship. You will say, no, in order to know friendship, we have to have a clear idea of which are the subjects, the right time of friendship, the place of friendship, and the acts of friendship. But as Aristotle would say, that there is no clear idea the borders between friends and not friends is fuzzy. But we look just for the central case of friendship, and this is where we begin. And this is a question I, I would like to raise to you. What if the borders are, are fuzzy? And if they are fuzzy, as Aristotle said, we will be inventing borders, and that, that would be not a really good exploratory speaking. What if the borders are fuzzy? And what is your take on, on this opponent model, which is not focused on borders, which is, it takes you, but that is Sotilia. It's just, it's just we take the central clearest case, and then we work out if there are, if there are if there are any sort of borders. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm not making any category mistake in what I'm saying. Thanks, that's, that's, uh, that's certainly a, a very uh, relevant and uh, uh, insightful question. Um, point well taken. Um, look, there are borders and there are, uh, first, uh, uh, in, in Spanish we would say, we, uh, we would have difficulties in, we don't have a word that's equivalent to boundaries in English. Uh, no, that's a border. Uh, that's a point. Uh, so we, we, I prefer the word boundary simply because it allows me to include the possibility of something such as um, temporal boundaries, uh, uh, subjective boundaries, differentiation between position between subject positions, uh, uh, and so forth. So I take your question as being, why the insistence on boundaries, and do we need to have a, a, a sharp boundaries? Can they be fuzzy? And can we work out from a paradigm case on the basis of which we uh, work out whether something is or is not bounded? Um, definitely, um, to begin with, uh, of course, boundaries in the law will have the kind of uh, exactness or fuzziness that is required at any given, in any given situation. Uh, I had a discussion about this with Zenon Bankowski in Edinburgh some time back. He said to me, well, look, I mean, 
you seem to have in mind the, the, the kind of boundaries that you have when you enter the, reach the passport control and then you get, you pass on your passport and they go through the swipe mechanism and then you're allowed to cross. So it's actually, you can actually have it. He says, but you know, you've got these boundary zones. So if you're going from, that's of course his favorite example, if you're going from Germany to Poland or vice versa, you've got this area in between. Yeah, and then he said, it's not a border. And I said, no, but it's a border or a border zone. And so law will draw the boundaries as sharply as it's required, given the nature of the behavior which needs to be regulated. And so precisely one of the things that interests me is making sure that we don't have such a narrow understanding of boundaries that we would take for granted that boundaries always have to be sharp. Boundaries can be fuzzy and they can remain fuzzy as long as it's necessary. And then when there is a situation that calls for sharpening boundaries, then they will be made, made, made sharp. In fact, there are many situations where boundaries are not even drawn and where boundaries will be drawn ex post. And therefore, what I would want to say is what interests me is not merely the idea of sharp boundaries, but the very process of emergence of boundaries and, and the specific temporal structure by which boundaries emerge. That's the first point. Second point. Um, about the f fuzziness of, bo of boundaries in, the, in terms of, um, of, uh, f of different uh, structures. For example, one of, um, one of Schmidt's reasons for hating the seas is that he said, you can't draw a boundary on the sea. If you were to do like this on the water, it disappears. Whereas you can draw a furrow in the ground. So for him, the state was the land. It's not true. There's a beautiful book by a guy called Edward Casey who works out at Stony Brook. He's a phenomenologist. And he points out that there are Polynesian uh, sailors who travel thousands of kilometers without a map. And yet for them, the sea is a living map. They can smell they, the color, the weed, all of these kinds of things, they can actually pinpoint where they are looking at the sea without having to look at the stars to within roughly a hundred kilometers of where they are. That's enough for what they need. So even the sea allows itself to be bounded in a certain sense. Second point. But third point, friendship. Of course, Aristotle is also the guy who said you can have friends and several friends, but you not, cannot be friends with anyone. Friendship with everyone is just no longer friendship. It has a circle of friends. And where that circle goes, that's not something that you can define in advance. It's in the, indeed a fuzzy, and it's more or less friends. But depending on the situation, you will draw lines of friendship and not. I'm happy with that. I'm not, I'm not trying to make a claim for law that necessarily goes beyond that. In some situations, law will be incredibly hard in the process of drawing boundaries. For example, um, Lampedusa is an island of, of um, Italy. It's the southernmost island quite close to uh, Libya. Now, what you've been seeing is waves of immigrants reaching Lampedusa. And what you've been seeing is that the Italian government, at least in the time of Berlusconi, would actually put these people into a zone, a camp, and without having anything like a rule of law, would, this camp was exactly contiguous to the, to the, to the, air, air, the airplane, uh, the, the airstrip, put them into airplanes, send them directly back to Libya without having any kind of asylum procedure, nothing whatsoever. So in certain situations, legal orders will draw boundaries in an incredibly hard and harsh way. In other words, they don't. I want to have a theory that explains all of that. And I think it does. Ask a, ask a question. Um, one example that came to mind uh, in, in trying to make sense of the, you know, you can be excluded but included at the same time. Uh, and the first one was my, my fascination with pirates and pirate normative orders. Yes. Uh, but a great example of enemy of any, enemy of all or hostis. Mm -hmm. You know, someone who's uh, a, a type of individual or group of individuals that are excluded, right? You don't have the same sorts of protections that you might otherwise have. Yeah. And yet there are uh, recognized means by which to deal with, with yeah. pirates or to apprehend yeah. them. Uh, of course, that leaves a, aside the whole question whether pirates, especially Somali pirates, have their own normative orders yeah. in which they 
uh, they order uh, ways of taking over ships and so on. It's, it, it's, it's normatively thick in many ways. Many ways. Um, but I, I was hoping, though, to ask a, a, a different question about, uh, and maybe to help, maybe ask to help, help fill out a little bit the grammar of inclusion and exclusion. Um, and so to ask inclusion and exclusion of, of what? Uh, so it seems that, that you, you don't want to place any limits on that. So at some, at some points, certain norms are included while others are necessarily excluded. So if you make it a norm that 50 miles per hour is the speed limit, then you're excluding other possible norms. Uh, in other cases, it's individuals that are excluded. Right? So if you're not a citizen or permanent resident, and you're excluded from certain benefits uh, within a, a particular legal system or, or state. Uh, in other instances, it's um, particular uh, legal orders entirely that are that are excluded by some being included. So international, some types of international law that are not incorporated are not, you know, thereby, thereby excluded uh, as well. So, Marnie, is is that is that part of the the goal to leave the gram of inclusion and exclusion quite quite broad? I mean, another example mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. if you choose one particular kind of economic arrangement, say markets, you're excluding other other possibilities. Mm -hmm. So you've got norms, people, types of economic arrangements, other legal orders, uh, even languages in which laws are expressed are exclusive in, uh, in many ways. Is it meant to be that, yeah, yeah, yeah. that broad? Good. Um, and is that, is that yeah. too broad? No. Um, thanks, Mike. This is again a, a great question. Just let me, um, just let me write it up. I like the pirates case in particular um, because, um, of course, I was I was at a restaurant one day. It was not the same restaurant, and they give you these sort of paper things, you know, uh, you know just to, so that you don't uh, get things dirty. And um, there was a sort of explanation of how the word buccaneer came into existence, and it had to do with um, with a place called Isla Tortuga which was an island of, of the tortoise island somewhere in the, in the Caribbean where a whole bunch of pirates were dumped and they ended up being um, having their own community and indeed having their own legal order just in the same way that the Somaliers do. And um, the point would be that the buccaneers, just like the Somali uh, pirates, are both within the order of international law in a certain sense and also out, outside it. And what your question points to is, of course, the more general discussion about um, um, unity and plurality and theories of legal pluralism. Now, what I would want to say is that I'm, I'm working with a double sense of the notion of plurality in that sense of orders. Um, and it has to do, to, to come back to the earlier question about identity, um, with the distinction between two understandings of, uh, of identity, sameness and, and selfhood. Selfhood has as its con so sameness, as Ricoeur puts it, has as its contrast as its contrast term difference. So something is either the same as itself or something else, or different from. And then there's another sense of contrast, another contrasting term for identity as selfhood that is other than self. Now, if it is the case that legal orders are always orders from a first-person plural perspective, therefore implying something like a self, we as a group are deemed to do something together. Then, in the very process of calling yourself a group, there is a process of inclusion and exclusion, which creates, makes room, literally and figuratively, for other legal orders. So there you have a minimal understanding of what pluralism is about. A range of legal orders, you include norms, you include behavior, you include basically also kinds of times, and you, um, and you exclude other possible legal orders which organize themselves in different ways. So that's, I think, the sort of uh, 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 easy understanding of what pluralism is about in terms of legal theory. And that's a lot of what I think, for example, Twining is, is, is trying to defend. And, and what's her name? Sally, whatever her last name is, I forget. Um, that's it. So you, you've got this whole range, you've got Buentura de Sosa Santos, all of these people working out that understanding of plurality. But I think there's a more fundamental understanding of plurality. That is, imagine that there were a global legal order. So imagine that, um, not improbable, Improb uh, imagine that, I mean, I could walk around yesterday without a thick coat in downtown um, 
Toronto. So, you know, I was expecting to have them snow boots and stuff, and uh, none of that was necessary. I saw some snow coming in from Newfoundland, but not even that much. Um, and so um, climate change, I mean, that's going to hit us. It's really going to clobber us. So imagine that we reach a decision. Well, we will have to have something like a global legal order to deal with this. We cannot continue dealing with this as a, as a sort of coordination problem. It will have to be a strong understanding of a world state of some kind that deals with this problem. Now, imagine that that global or state would, in one way or other, encompass all states. Now, we would have to reach decisions about what would be involved in the process of trying to deal with global climate, climate change. Now, dollars to donuts that whatever decision is taken will be a decision that has to be contested. And it will be contested. I mean, just look at some of the outlandish, I would view it as outlandish, literally, literally out hyphen landish, um, things which are being said by some of the born again Christians about global, global climate change. I understand that in, in Yellowstone, you actually have two explanations of how Yellowstone came about. The scientific one, and the creationist perspective, where they actually open a faucet or something like that, where there's a, a you know some a trough with snow, with sand and stuff, um, whichever. Now, whatever you would have to do with that global state, it would be a global state that would have to have a point. That is to say, it would have an order that says what it is that we're doing together. And in that process, you will include and exclude. And therefore, in the process of unifying all legal orders into one single world order, you're also pluralizing because you're opening up a space for contestation from people who would perhaps even violently disagree of what it is that we need to do together to deal with climate change. Many of these people wouldn't even necessarily agree that it's a problem of climate change. So these are the different understandings of uh, inclusion and exclusion that I have in mind. Yes, it's inclusion and exclusion of norms, but it's also, for example, inclusion and exclusion of times. Now that sounds very strange. What do I mean by saying inclusion and exclusion of times? Let me give you a very concrete example which I was working on in this earlier book. There's an, a first nation in Colombia that's called the Uva. And the Uva have used to live in a quite a large part of the country, and they have been steadily pushed, compressed into a reservation which is quite small by now. Now, the Colombian Ministry of Education, uh, education um, of, of, of oil, uh, oils and stuff, gave the, uh, Oxy, an American petroleum uh, oil company, rights to explore and drill in areas adjacent to their lands. Now, these people became very contestatious about that. And um, they knocked down fences. They, they went very far in trying to oppose this. They even threatened to commit collective suicide. And this was no empty threat in the past when the Spaniards came. These people actually, half of the Uva population, jumped off a cliff and died. So it was no empty threat. They were prepared to do it. Now, you would say, what, why, why different times and borders of time? Well, in a sense, when the Uva were contesting the fact that Colombia was prepared to grant rights of exploration in lands contiguous to their own sacred lands, it's not only that they were speaking from a place that they don't feel as being part of Colombia. When that case came before the court, they did not themselves uh, uh, participate in the, uh, in, the, in the discussion. It was the national ombudsman who did that. Because of course for them it was clear, if they participate in the proceedings to, uh, to, stop, to quash the administrative act which had allowed for that, for that, uh, for that, um, for that uh, drilling, they were delivering themselves over to the Colombian legal system because if they participate, then they're part of it. But they have never part accepted the fact that they're part of Colombia. So they're not only a xenotopia, they're not only speaking to us from, a, from another place, they're also in a real sense also speaking to us from another time. Of course, in a sense, it's calendar time. Our calendar time is the same as theirs, but not really. Well, it, we have a calendar time that we would encompass them in. But in their, un their understanding of what history is, is about, it's not our understanding of history. And even consider calendar time. Calendar time, which is as close as we can get to trying to flatten out time into interchangeable particles, presupposes a beginning point in time. Calendar time, for, for Christians, is with the, with the birth of Jesus. For Jews, it's another one. For, to a certain extent at least, for other groups, it's, a, it's another understanding of time. So time always is a significant time, which means that we don't always sit in the same channel of time. 
there are times which intertwine with each other. And what I'm trying to do is, how can you include these kinds of issues in legal theory? And not merely in law and society or in legal sociology. I think these issues should be part of what a, the understanding of what legal order is about. To come back to your question, as a question about the identity of legal orders. Yeah. So that my start wants to come for a second question. I, I have just one okay. question. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, there was a talk that someone gave here about a year ago, and she said that her project that she's working on is she said anytime you have a revolution, part of what comes with a revolution is a, a new calendar, a new time. So yeah. you know, year zero in yeah. the new calendar yeah. for the French Revolution yeah. and, and, and so yeah. on. And other, she had other examples. Which yeah. Wrong, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's, a, that's a spectacular example. Yeah. You have time for one last question. So there I, we go. I, I have a, a small comment and yeah. a larger question. The small comment is you say, we cannot say we. Somebody has to say we as free yeah. liberty. I'm not surprised that that point comes from a phenom phenomenologist and not from an analytical thinker because I think it's, it, it's simply not true, right? So you, mm -hmm. Mike, and I can get together uh, and decide that we're going to, uh, as a group, decide a certain amount of things through a certain decision procedure mm -hmm. um, and decide that. Um, we're going to, once the outcome is decided, we're going to basically say it together. This is the outcome. So we are all going to say it, right? So mm -hmm. it may be that the decision procedure, and that I take this from Petr, right, mm -hmm. is subject to something that he calls the discursive dilemma, right, which is such that uh, given how the decision procedure is set up, the ultimate decision of the group does not correspond to the decision of any of the individuals. So you have the decision of the group which emanates from uh, the decision procedure. It is our decision, right? There was no decision that came before. And then given we've decided to reveal this to the world altogether, we just say, here's our decision, right? Mm -hmm. So it seems mm -hmm. here that we have a decision of the group, mm -hmm. right? That we are revealing to, to, together to the world and it's not premature to do so, right? Mm -hmm. So the, that was just uh, the comment. The, the larger question has to do with the order of your argument, right? Because so you seem to want to talk about a certain set of problems. That's how you answer in my initial question. You say, these are the normative problems that I want to get to, mm -hmm. right? But when you give us the account of the explanandum, as it were, it seems to me that you're building the explanandum with a bunch of normative considerations that are going to help you at the end address mm -hmm. these questions. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering why the argument goes from, let's say, a more descriptive kind of, or at least so you claim more descriptive kind of feel towards normative question, as opposed to saying, well, here are my, it, here's my normative take, here are the type of things I want to, the kind of problems I want to address, and here's the kind of problem, and here's an account of boundaries, and if you want to call that law, that's called law, mm -hmm. that will allow mm -hmm. us to make sense of those, mm -hmm. right, as opposed to just engaging, like many people, yeah. philosophers do, and yeah. say, I'm providing you with an account of law, yeah. right, and then you yeah. say, well, to what end, right, yeah. so. Yeah, 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 right. Okay, thanks. Um, the first question, let me, let me say something about that. Um, um, well, of course, the, the, uh, it reminds me of a discussion I had with, uh, with a colleague some time back. Uh, I was making a claim about representation, about the necessity of representation, and of there even being the need of representation with a collective of two people. And... Um, he said, well, look, you know, I, mean, I hadn't said that yet. He said, well, we're speaking about democracy. It was Andreas Calivas in the New School. And uh, he said, he's a strong defender of direct democracy. So he said, well, yeah, I agree that, you know, democracy needs uh, representation, but even the Greeks in a certain sense, but how many people do you think that you need to have for, for representation in democracy? 30,000 people? And I said, well, actually two is enough, Andreas. And he was rather astonished about it. Um, and wh what I would want to say is this. Um, of course, to the extent that the, the we acts through its participants, then each one of these participants has to say we on behalf of the group. So at that very simple level, someone, it's only to the extent that people act in a way that they intermesh their, their, their behavior with each other, that you actually have a, a group. And so what I want to say is that the structure of, 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 a, of a group is such that 
the participants, I mean, if you want to avoid anything like a, like a reificational analysis, a sort, of, a sort of heavy social ontology where you have the group as existing independently of its participants, which I definitely don't want to have. I don't see a group as being anything other than that process of interacting with each other. That means that the group is radically dependent on the individuals that compose it, who have to act and speak on its behalf, as it were. So it's at that very, that very basic level, even for a two-person group, a duet, that you have what I would call representation. It's not only that we has to say, that someone has to say behalf on a we, it's also that when people are playing, someone plays on behalf of a we, a duet. So that's, that would be my first point. Now, why is it premature? Well, because in a certain sense, you and I can agree at this point, what, what we think, what it is that we're thinking of doing, what we're doing. But if we have a lot, if it turns out that it's a process of, say, walking back into the center of town or whatever, it might turn out to be the case that what you and I understood as are being do, are doing together, is something that at when we encountered the specific context, it turns out that we actually had quite different ideas of what it is that we were thought we were doing together, and then may our ways twain. And so what I want to say is that because um, collective action implies that individuals will act and speak on behalf of a we, the proof will have to be in the pudding. That is to say, whether we have a group is something that always has to be reiterated in action that confirms the assumption that we are a we, and that is, that is, that is a presupposition that, we are, that, that, we, that we, there is a collective, which has to be reconfirmed each time around at the risk that it falls apart. Look at what's happened with the European Union now. An ever closer union among the peoples of Europe. What we're now seeing is that there is a fundamental split between Eastern European countries and say Western liberal European countries about the significance of having Muslim immigrants enter Europe. So Orban, the uh, president of Hungary, said categorically this, he said, I view the arrival of all of these, um, all of these uh, immigrants not as a danger for Europe, but as an opportunity. So then Merkel and everyone said, thank God. And what was the coda? He said, because this is finally the chance to have a front against Islam. So for Orban, Europe is Europe of the Christians, perhaps of the Jews. Now, when Hungary and uh, some of the other Visegrad countries, as they're called, joined Europe, there was the understanding that we had a joint project. And it was definitely not this joint project. And depending on what it is of what, what we come across in the process of acting together, it turns out that say, having said we together may or may not have been premature. I don't want to say more than that but it does have quite significant implications in terms of, of the structure of, 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 of the politics of, of, of collective action. Well, that's a small question. It's not small. Uh, the big question, um, look, why I'm not going directly to a, to a normative project. Can I confess that I've got a book here that I'm reading now and I'm doing my best to just not throw it out. I have a PhD who wants to write a, 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 a thesis on this book. It's a book by a guy called Alan Buchanan, called Justice, Legitimacy, and Self-Determination. And I'm just getting so fucking angry with this book. Because um, there is here just a sense of normativity that has absolutely no understanding about the problem of how the politics of boundaries works. It's not that I'm against cosmopolitanism. I would be much more favorable, and I'm, I am personally, politically, more inclined to a cosmopolitan project than to a communitarian project, no doubt about it. But what I see in this kind of a normative project and so much political liberal thinking is a blatant disregard for just the nitty gritty of what phenomenology tries to do, and that is to describe what's there. You never can only describe. You're always normative um, presuppositions involved in our process of trying to describe reality. But there is, as Husserl puts it, zu der Sache selbst, to the things themselves, there is really something to be said for beginning with, with descriptive analysis. And that's why I definitely want to come back to your question. That's why I still remain, if not at heart, then at least methodologically, first, if not necessarily foremost, first a legal positivist. I want to describe the workings of the law. 
And what does that mean for the normative issue? The reason why I don't dip directly into normativity is that um, I think that at the basis of any normative project is a theory, implicit or explicit, about how boundaries work in terms of inclusion and exclusion. And until you have managed to understand how boundaries do that work, which is what I just mentioned, including what they exclude and excluding what they include, any attempt to try to directly translate a theory of the boundaries of legal orders into a normative project misses out on the complexities, both conceptual, empirical, and normative, of what it is to engage with the politics of how, how should Europe deal today with the process of, of immigration? It's a very complicated question. And someone like Joe Kerens, who has been doing, in some ways, very good work, I just don't see the guy having any kind of an adequate context-sensitive response to the huge challenges which we are facing. But no, neither does Walter. You will remember in the Spheres of Justice of, of the first chapter of Walter, where he discusses, you know, the first act of distribution is who gets to be a member, who doesn't. He blatantly disregards the process of drawing the first boundary. So. Unless the reason why I'm postponing normativity is not because I'm worried about normativity, but to give normativity a chance. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your questions and thank you so much. Thank you.